Can you see my slide now, Dr. Neeraj? If you could, you can. Okay, yeah. Uh, just join so you can just allow them in so you're a co-host so yeah. uh, i'll start off here yeah? so uh good evening uh, dear friends uh, i welcome you all to this uh continuous meditation southeast spirituality orthopedic center from bangalore in uh for today's program the faculty are dr guraj sangoni bhai unit head at uh, indian spinal injury center new delhi which is the capital of india and mr mehul acharya from even orthopedic center and i'll be co-hosting uh, uh, this meet so at the outset i would welcome all of you to the my second first international cm program 2021 i want to thank all the faculty for their valuable time to educate us today special thanks to mr ceo of innomax medical holdings limited uk for providing educational grant for this program and a big thanks to dr ashok and dr neeraj bijlani from ortho team for making this program go live in india and a special thanks to my good friend mr david penford from clockwork medical uk who is making this program available in uk last but not the least i would like to thank the delegates for being part of this unit thought provoking webinar special thanks to them for indicating what they would love to hear in future namely they have indicated in our survey that they would like to hear about pelvic spine trauma hip trauma and difficult orthoplasty and we'll plan our programs in the future accordingly today's program overview about the sacroiliac dysfunction i will start with introduction of the facts and bit about basics of sacroiliac joint and uh, this will be followed by sacroiliac dysfunction from a spinal surgeon's point of view and uh, to fuse a, a sacroiliac joint in a scoliosis tips and tricks from dr guraj sangoni bhai and finally it will be followed by evidence based treatment algorithm for sacroiliac dysfunction from a pelvic vascular surgeon point of view from mr mehul acharya lastly there will be opportunity for question and answers and we will conclude introduction to dr guraj sangoni bhai he is a consultant and unit head at department Surgery, Indian Spinal Injury Center, New Delhi, which is the capital of this country. I know many of you are joined from US and uh, Europe as well. Uh, he did his MBBS and MS from uh, Saint John's Medical College, Bangalore, uh, which is where this uh, uh, broadcast from. So he's very much our local boy, and he did his FNP in uh, the same center where he's working now. He is Community Development Officer, Avo Spine, Indian Subcontinent. he is a member education committee of association of spine surgeons of india he is a ex ec member of assi he was a visiting fellow in minimally access spine surgery munich germany he was a visiting fellow in spinal deformity usa in hong kong he was a visiting fellow in cervical spine surgeries sapporo in japan and he was a visiting dartmouth hitchcock fellow in the united states and he was a visiting fellow in spinal tumor surgery in italy our uh, next uh, faculty is dr mehul acharya who hails from bristol he is a orthopedic consultant from north bristol which is one of the busiest major trauma centers in the uk level 1 trauma center he specializes in pelvic vascular reconstruction complex trauma and hip and knee reconstruction he did a fellowship in complex and revision orthoplasty from australia a teacher and has won prestigious brain of the year award in 2014 He is a deputy lead for skills and innovation in Severn Deanery. He is faculty in prestigious maternal and AO pelvic courses in the UK. He is a co-convener of a boutique Bristol Hip Orthoplasty course, which myself and uh, Dr. Mohan TV have been broadcasting into the Indian subcontinent in the last two, three years. He is going to talk about evidence-based approach to sacroiliac dysfunction. Coming to the basics, sacroiliac dysfunction, the enigma. So, though for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Shrikant Kane. I'm a consultant knee and hip surgeon. I was formerly a consultant trauma and uh, joint reconstruction surgeon in the UK. I'm at present proprietor and managing director of Southeast Superficiality Knee and Hip Centre in Bangalore and Campbell Hospital in Bangalore. Coming to the dilemma of this particular region, this region consists of uh, lower lumbar spine, sacrum, sacral spine, and the innominate bones and the acetabulum. 
and uh, if you look at the kinematics and interplay of the uh, the different structures such as region it is still poorly understood in 2021 the effect of pelvic movement on the cup in the supine sitting and standing position is a related topic in orthoplasty in 2021 we know as a rule of thumb that posterior pelvic tilt opens the cup and antiverts it and anterior pelvic is the opposite that is closes the cup and retroverts it the functional cup axis range has replaced levinac safe zones for hip orthoplasty surgeons and we are moving away from the transverse vestibular ligament to the psoas fossa to avoid psoas impingement the optimized position software is becoming showing a important role in addressing this pelvic issues in correctly doing the hip orthoplasty surgery we know that in 80% of all the dislocated primary hips needing revision there's a postural pathology this brings us on to the hot debate which we've been having whether to operate hip first or spine first in dual pathology and you know when a total hip replacement is done and then a lateral fusion a short or long that leads to increased stiffness and retroverts the cup leading to increased paper from daniel eng and group in general surgery in 2020 which goes into the details of this so it's worth a good read and uh, hence i my request to all the orthoplasty surgeons in this group is that you know if there is a dual pathology kindly refer the spine surgeon like our friend here dr gururaj for them to deal with the spine then we can deal with the hip so hence the order of the talk here as well we allowed the spine surgeon to go before the sabla surgeon to say that the sacral function may be a red you know it, it's a cause of around 30% 25% of the low back pain and as you know low back pain epidemiology 60 to 90% of adults experience back pain at some point in their so it's a very very common problem the incidence is peak between 35 to 55 years 90% resolve in 6 weeks time 7% become chronic male and female are equal in 85% of cases precise pathoanatomic diagnosis is not available back pain is typically to respiratory illness as a reports symptom related doctor visits in the corona pandemic definitely the respiratory is first prize in the world but this back pain will take the second prize so it is not that uncommon if we look for it so as introduction to sacroiliac dysfunction it generally refers to pain in the sacroiliac region caused by abnormal motion in the sacroiliac joint either too much motion or too little motion the sacroiliac joint pain is common cause of axial low back pain affecting around 25 to 30% of the the sacroiliac joint dysfunction or the fourth common cause of low back pain and pelvic pain or a 10% so low back pain pelvic and referred lower extremity pain due to this the sacroiliac uh, joint surface area is greater than greater in males compared to females we also take increased biomechanical loading so slightly higher in males compared to females let me go to sacral muscles and nerves i know many of the physiotherapists are joining so i'll be keeping it a little bit basic so i apologies to uh, senior surgeons in the group here if it is too basic the sacrum is a large triangular bone at the base of the spine by the fusion of sacral fibra s1 to s5 the sacrum is situated at the upper back part of between the two uh, uh, wings of the ilium it forms a joint with four other bones the two projections at the side of the sacrum are called the sacral ala in the articulate with the ilium and the l shaped or a key shape sacroiliac the upper part of the sacrum connects with the last lumbar vertebra and is lower the coccyx via the sacrum cor coccygeal cornu if you look at the you know the weight transmission the upper limb body weight is transmitted through the vertebra to the sacrum then through the sacroiliac joint to the innominate bones the ilium there to the hip joint and to the legs so the joint significant amount of the body weight if you look at the uh, the joint anatomy dilar sinovial joint it's a weight bearing and shock absorbing as just mentioned it is kidney bean shaped its irregular articular surface resists shear forces it helps in the attachment of various and stabilizing the pelvis post in the pelvic ring these are the pictures here look on the bottom left from the top and the if you go into the joint structure it's a diarthroidal joint with 
two uh, bony components separated by one to two millimeter. The joint surfaces are lined with hyaline cartilage, and the iliac cartilage is little thin sacral counterpart. The superior third of the hyaline iliac cartilage is found surrounding stabilizing ligaments, forming wide margins of fibrocartilage. The inferior, however, forms a synovial joint. This is the major ligaments of the uh, pelvis, starting from below upwards, the ligament, the sacrospinous ligament, and most important, uh, sacroiliac ligament, ligaments. And if you look at the important uh, sacroiliac ligament, it comes in three anterior, the middle of the intraosseous, or the dorsal sacroiliac uh, ligament. And the intraosseous ligament is massive bond between the upper parts of the joint. Muscles which are attaching to the sacroiliac region, the muscles which are attaching to the sacrum are the erector spinae, iliocastalis, longissimus, multiform that which attaches to the innominate bone or the ilium or the obliquus muscle, the internal external transverse obliquus muscle and the quadratus lumborum. But to the front of the sacrum, you have attachment of piriform, which basically tilts the sacrum anteriorly and rotates the sacrum to the opposite side, assisted by the ipsilateral gluteus maximus and contralateral latimus draws gluteus maximus through LDF causes mutation or flexion of the sacrum, extension of the LS joint. Long end of the biceps also acts, it uh, causes backward rotate sacrum to the same side. The longest and multifidus pull sacral base superiorly and posteriorly the ligaments. Look at the innervation, the iliac joint is inverted richly from almost L4 to S4. You can see the various dissections papers from 1957 to 1998. Uh, from L4 to S4, innovation is there, which makes it a, a joint and hence a significant pain generator in the. If you look at the, you know, the biomechanics, kinematics of these uh, uh, joints, sacral leg joint, it has got multiple axes, three transverse axes, and then longitudinal and oblique axis. On the left, you see axis, and the, the third or the most inferior transverse axis important because the innominate rotates around this axis. And if you look at vertical axis, also important, but the, the oblique axis, the left oblique axis and the right oblique axis, axis along which the sacrum tries to rotate or the torsion occurs. Look at the sacral joint movement. There is mutation, there is, then there is counter mutation, which is basically extension of the sacrum. Then there is forward rotation on the oblique axis, then backward rotation on the oblique axis, which could be right or left oblique axis. Let's look at some of the physiologic and pathologic movements of the sacral. The physiologic ones are the left sacral torsion on the left oblique axis, the right torsion on the right oblique axis, bilateral anterior sacral mutation or flexion, bilateral posterior sacral mutation or extension, anterior sacral mutation with exhalation, posterior sacral mutation with inhalation. The pathologic movements are the left torsion on right oblique axis, not left oblique axis, but the right oblique axis, right sacral torsion on the left oblique axis, the left unilateral, not bilateral anterior mutation, which is a flexion, or a right unilateral anterior flexion, the left and right unilateral posterior extension. Impairments, anything which causes you know, excessive compression in the joint, for example, ankylosing spondylitis, which eventually fuses the joint, or capsular fibrosis, or overactivation of the global myofascial system, or sometimes joint fixation to deal with underlying instability can cause uh, this uh, syndrome. And also insufficiency of articular compression, which can occur in ligamentous activity and underactivity of the local myofascial system also leads to sacral dysfunction. So what are the somatic dysfunction? You know, the function, if you look at the stability in most of the sacral -like joint is a result of the shape of the joint, what is called as a form closure. And it's also because of altering of the ligamentous tension in response to change of the muscle tone, what is called as a forced closure. So the dysfunction basically is an imbalance of tension and tone between muscle and ligaments, which locks sacral neck joint and prevents normal function. These are some of the sacral neck somatic dysfunctions. These are some of the causes of the sacral neck dysfunction. I'm uh, sure uh, Dr. Acharya is going to go into details of this. Important thing I'll mention here, the leg length discrepancy, which can be congenital or acquired, for example, post-EHR, can cause sacral neck dysfunction. Also, structural pelvic asymmetry, which can be congenital, or a pelvic obliquity seconded to massive kyphoscoliotic deformities, 
can also cause sacroiliac dysfunction as in neuromuscular scoliosis or pelvic scoliosis and dr gurra changodimat will be dealing with this aspect clinical features again dr mez will deal with this in detail so basically i would say it's unilateral low back pain radiating locally which can be a sciatic type radiculopathy activities of daily living are affected and uh, you know really it can cause coxio dynia this is a typical picture of the sacroiliac pain you can see the unilateral nature of the sacroiliac joint pain with these basics i hand over the podium to dr gurraj changodiman unit head of indian spinal injury center delhi for sacroiliac fixation in scoliosis and this will be followed by mr acharya who is going to talk about evidence based approach to sacroiliac dysfunction over to you dr gurraj i will stop sharing my slide so that you could share your slide Uh, Doctor Guru, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you share your slide, please? Yeah, we can see sacropelvic fixation options. Over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, depending upon the time zones uh, wherever we are. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Srikanth uh, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this webinar and uh, discuss this uh, mostly uh, very interesting topic. So, as a spine surgeon, I am going to mainly cover uh, both fixations, not only SI joint. Uh, sacro pelvic fixations uh, when it comes to uh, scoliosis as such and we will cover uh, the other indications also okay one minute. yeah so uh, sacroiliac joint is one of the most neglected joints uh, we have least studied it and we have least understood that is why this lot of controversy and we all know that most of us and a lot of us uh, we were not doing any sacroiliac fusions or sacroiliac uh, joint operations before and now with the uh, people talking about it more with gaining knowledge we have we have all started discussing and that is why this webinar today to discuss about this very interesting uh, joint sacroiliac joint uh, has got as dr srikant was mentioning its large variability in shape and ranges of motion uh, even though there is very less range of motion but the minimal range of motion which is present in the joint is very important and which causes actually a lot of low back pain and that is why even if we tend to think that sacroiliac displacements and rotations and dysfunctions are negligible but they are not because till now we were not understanding it's basically the pathomechanics of the si joint that is why we tended to ignore the basically etiology of back pain from the si joint so when it comes to sacroiliac joint or pelvic fixation in terms of spine uh, what are the indications uh, it needs to be done whenever we do long fusions to the sacrum whenever there are neuromuscular def deformities with pelvic obliquity and in degenerative scoliosis or adult scoliosis and in structural lumbosacral deformities which involve the sacrum also and in high grade spondylolisthesis and in lumbar and sacral tumors so let's focus on scoliosis uh, we all know that uh, basically uh, the abnormal postural strain with the scoliosis which happens there is change in the biomechanics of the body there is both it is a scoliosis is a three dimensional deformity there is a deformity in coronal plane there is a deformity in sagittal plane and there is a deformity in a rotational plane so these all three dimensional deformity puts long time stresses on the si joint and it causes accelerated degeneration or it, it itself causes rotation or displacements in the si joint causing basically si joint pathologies so we all know that adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the most common type of scoliosis we see and it has been found that the scoliosis is positive
correlated with SI joint dysfunctions uh, in patients with uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So when it comes to neuromuscular scoliosis, it becomes important because it is the second most common type of uh, deformity which we see uh, in terms of scoliosis. And this mainly happens because of the muscle imbalance or underlying neuropathic and myopathic disease. This is how it causes a lot of stress on the pelvis and pelvis to sway to one side and causing SI joint dysfunctions and basically the whole pelvis to rotate or go into deformed position in a coronal plane. So this is what is the speciality of a neuromuscular scoliosis. If you see in this diagram, there's so much of pelvic complicity and these patients even find difficult to sit without support because of this obliquity of the pelvis. Uh, this because of this, basically, the whole uh, pelvis mechanism is altered. So that is why in this kind of patients, you have pelvic obliquity and pelvis also rotates, which also causes SI joint dysfunction. So this is what I was mentioning in neuromuscular scoliosis. There is the triad of these three, that is hip dislocation. It usually starts with the hip getting subluxated. subluxated and then it, it getting dislocated. And once it gets starts dis dislocating, it also develops the scoli and it also develops the pelvic obliquity causing this uh, deformity called the wind blown deformity, where basically the one hip is in adduction, one day hip is in abduction, and there is a pelvic obliquity associated with scoliosis. So these kind of deformities, if you see here, so much of deformity is there. So to correct these and fix it to the pelvic, into the spine is really really challenging and it also depends on a lot of other factors so why do we need to fix this or to the uh, si joint in uh, neuromuscular scoliosis uh, you have a fixed pelvic which cannot be corrected just by correcting the scoliosis then you have to go down to pelvis and include your si joints typically if your pelvic obliquity is more than 15 to 20 degrees you need to go down to pelvis uh, and then if, I, if you don't go into the what happens is there is an increased risk of recurrence of deformity and then these patients tend to have a more revision surgeries if you don't go down into the pelvis and going down into the pelvis also corrects this pelvic obliquity giving them a good sitting balance and if the patient is ambulatory giving them a good basically biomechanics for walking. So then the next aspect is SI joint and long fusions to the spine. Whenever we do a long fusions to the lumbar spine, going down into the sacrum, that is going down into the S1 pedicles, there is an increased motion because we have taken away all the motions from the lumbar spine. The, there is an increased motion happening in the SI joint. This increased motion accelerates the degeneration happening in the SI joint. So that is why this is I have found that 25% of the patients do become symptomatic in terms of dysfunction whenever you do a long number fusions going down into the sacrum. So, and then the other aspect is degenerative spine or adult scoliosis. So you, we need to go down to pelvis or fuse SI joints for, for different reasons. So they can be fused or go down to the SI joints in, to stabilize and fuse degenerated SI joint. With the degeneration of the spine, there can be already existing degeneration of the SI joints. If you have a very significant SI joint pain, you might have to go down and fuse them along with the lumbar fusion. And also to protect S1 screws, because we will see why we do we need to protect S1 screws. We do these long uh, lumbar fusions going down into the sacrum to S1. Usually the S1 screws tend to fail. So we need to protect them with the extra protection. That is how we... Uh, tend to do a SI joint fusions or uh, pelvic fusions in pelvic fixation in these patients. And then uh, these patients can also have deformity in both in coronal and sagittal planes. So wh what I might mean by sagittal plane is pelvic actually retroverts when the these patients starts degenerating. So we need to get that retroversion decreased and get the good sacral slope to maintain a harmonious lumbosacral and thoracic and cervical spine sagittal balance. So we need to go down to the pelvis for this reason also. And when we do these long fixations, we have to have a good 
base for these fixations otherwise these fixations tend to fail that is why we we also go into the uh, si joint so this is what i was telling why do we need to go into the pelvis to protect s1 screws because s1 pedicles we all know that they are very capacious they are mainly a cancellous bone it is not a it is not like other pedicles there is a, a cancellous and cortical bone it's the uh, sacrum s1 pedicle is mainly a cancellous bone and it is capacious and short so that is why we need to protect it and sacrum bone is usually osteopenic especially when it comes to elderly age group and failure rate of s1 screw is almost up to the tune of 44% when when it is done along with the long fixation to the lumbar spine and inadequate as the only means of fixation in long fusions because of all uh, reasons mentioned above so when we have discussed all this we also know i know these things will be discussed by uh, dr acharya uh, so we have physical therapy steroid injections radio frequency ablation open or minimally invasive sij fusions that is si joint fusions so these are going to be discussed by dr acharya as a spine surgeon what we can basically concentrate whenever we do these long constructs we usually do what is this s2 alar iliac screws uh, that is which goes from the ala ala sacral ala to si joint and then into the ilium so there are iliac screws also but then because of the uh, ease of doing s2 ala iliac screws and connecting them to long fixations now most of the surgeons are doing uh, s2 ala iliac screws right thank you so why again it comes to uh, basically these uh, long screws into ilium or s2 ala iliac screws a uh, white is very important to have these long screws because if you see in this diagram this is the pivot point at which there is a lumbosacral joint basically rotates so whenever you are if your fixation is going ventral to this pivot point the fixation is going to be more stronger and it reaches the flexion the more the length of the screw ahead of this pivot point so that is why if you see uh the screws which are in the s1 pedicle or the s2 ai screws or the ilex screws are much longer and they go much anterior to this pivot point that is why these are more resistant for flexion and they do actually control the flexion more as compared to s1 pedicle screws so that's the pivot point uh, at which the basically the sacroiliac joint or the uh, lumbosacral uh, motion happens so when it comes to sacropelvic fixation uh, there are uh, there is a concept of three zones of obrain zone 1 is s1 vertebral body and a cephalad margin of sacral ala uh, that is this green zone and zone 2 is inferior margins of the sacral ala or and 2 and 2 s2 to the tip of the coccyx this red zone and then zone 3 is a ilium so fixation strength improves from zone 1 to zone 3 because if you see this is the alar screw this is the pedicle and this is the iliac screw or s2 ai screws which go much much more ventral as compared to these screws giving more uh, strength to the uh, prevention of flexion at this uh, joint so if we come to the evolution uh, from 1960 to almost like 2005 when the s2 alar iliac uh, screw was introduced uh, we started with harrington hooks uh, then mose alar hooks then anterior grafts then luke and luke galveston technique anterior sacral fixation to say screws two screws and then we had these iliac screws and then uh, came the two alar iliac screws so the most there are many options to do this fusion or fixation but then the most commonly used techniques are these three techniques galveston technique or iliac screws or sacral alar iliac screws Galveston technique is used only when if you are using the uh, basically sublaminar wires with the uh, hard shell. So these are different kinds of techniques which we can use. So this is the Galveston technique which was most commonly used uh, in neuromuscular spinal deformities. It's very inexpensive and but difficult to get the correct angle which goes into the ilium and it which negotiates the angle at the Uh, lumbosacral junction so 
and then because it is just a well, posterior stabilization and uh, it is dorsal stabilization it really doesn't prevent the flexion so there is a very uh, basically loss of correction happened in this technique and because of this windshield phenomena you can see that uh, with the wobbling movement here happening it used to loosen very frequently and then came a caustic transsacral bar uh, it was much better as compared to uh, the Galveston technique. Uh, it used the uh, Harrington technique and this sacral bar which went into the iliac wings which was connected to the S1 screws and then ALR screws. But then they were connected with the connector to the lumbar fusion. But again this was less stable in flexion as we were mentioning because it is only a dorsal fixation it doesn't go down to the ventral slide it doesn't cross cross the pivot point again it was less stable in flexion then iliac screws which was the most commonly used fixation and still it is used when we need a multiple fixation into the pelvis and uh, basically implants were easier to place with the connection connectors and it reduced basically lumbosacral junction motion because it went anteriorly and it is more protective of uh, S1 screws as compared to cages. So this was a study which they published in uh, basically in 190 patients, 67 out of 190 patients underwent iliac screws, minimum two year follow up. But if you see here again, in especially in older age group, the screws failed again in 34.3% patients and major failure happened where, where they required revision surgeries in almost 12% patients. So that is why we needed better uh, prospects to this. So we'll see in next slides what is it. So some few technical points and tips and tricks of the iliac screws. The entry point is typically uh, near the PSIS. It's almost like 1.5 centimeter cephalad and medial to the uh, PSIS that is posterior superior iliac spine and then this is a S1 pedicle uh, entry point this is a iliac screw entry point you can take actually two uh, iliac screws you can put in one one side and uh, two iliac screws on the another side depending upon the uh, place you have and uh, basically how do you do it you are um, you expose your posterior superior iliac spine and you create a space for the screw head to sit inside the PSIS, otherwise it remains proud and it starts basically pinching whenever they lie supine and then most of the times these screws to be get removed because of this skin pinching which happens if you don't bury them inside the uh, PSIS. That is why you create a small recess for approximately as I told 1.5 centimeter cephalad and medial to the PSIS to accommodate the elex screw head. And um, then this is how your uh, probe should look. You, you can use basically a lengthy probe, a gear shift uh, probe, and your direction, it should be parallel to the lamina of the L5. And both your probes should cross above the L5 spinous process. So you should cross like this, then you are in a uh, basically correct angulation. This is for freehand method. Uh, this is how it should look and the direction is always towards the anterior inferior iliac spine or you can palpate your greater trochanter and just go above that. So that is how uh, a typical iliac screw uh, will look like and it needs a connector to, co to connect it to the S1 pedicle because they are much much uh, lateral as compared to your S1 uh, pedicle screws. So how do you do it? few cases if you want to get a radiographical guidance you need always two views that is lateral views lateral views to see this sciatic notch both the sciatic notches on the right left should be overlapping properly and then the both tabulum should be overlapping uh, on each other properly when you have a dead lateral view of your pelvis so then your pedicle screw will come above the sciatic notch and above the acetabulum so if, if you have to see uh, whether you are it through and through into the bony uh, confluence, so you have to see these three points. That is, this is a uh, anterior inferior uh, iliac spine. And that's the basically iliac cortical bone, which you see here. 
uh, basically the sclerotic bone here and that is the psis so if you get a obturator oblique outlet view all these three come to be overlapping and you start seeing this tear drop uh, very clearly and then if you see that and then if your screw is going along this medial border of this tear drop that is the most safest zone where you you, you are sure that your screw is going to be through and through interosseous and you don't breach the borders uh, anteriorly or posteriorly so that is how the screw looks that's at the psis that is at the iliac wing that's at the between the tables and that is near the asis uh, then coming to the uh, another technique that is S2 LR iliac screw that which is the most recent advancement and which is most favored fixation method right now because of its obvious reasons which we are going to discuss now. So basically it starts from the sacral ala and then crosses the SI joint and goes into the ileum. So this basically uh, why it is more advantageous because it's it is not as prominent as iliac screws so that is why the pinching or bursitis around this head is very uh, uncommon with these screws because they are deeper within the muscle envelope and they are in line with the lumbar fixations which we are doing in line with the s1 pedicle screws so it, they don't need cross connectors to be used or they don't need extender or a connectors to connect it to the uh, long fixations and it is ideal for pelvic obliquity correction because it is in line with the lumbar spine and a good platform for derotation because again it is in line with the lumbar fixation. So the fixation point, uh, the starting point is usually around the uh, between the S1 and S2 foramen to the lateral border of the S1 and S2 foramen and then it goes down towards the again anterior inferior iliac spine and uh, you can palpate your greater trochanter and go towards that and uh, basically the trajectory depends upon the pelvic obliquity and sacral tilt how much is there how much is the sacral slope depending upon that but then usually the uh, direction is almost 45 degrees to the floor and 20 to 30 degrees caudal if you have to do it freehand it is you have to imagine that your uh, probe is just lying above the spinous process of a L5 or uh, S. So what you have to see is if you are using a gear shift, you always use your gear shift, which is turned towards up for initial uh, 25, cent 25 millimeter till you go get into the SI joint. Because if you personally, there are nerve roots, you might injure if you inadvertently uh, pierce the uh, ventral uh, ventral uh, basically surface so point it towards dorsal region initial 25 millimeters once you reach the si joint there is an increased resistance and then take out your gear shift and then direct it ventrally now so you can use a all or a drill to start your uh, starting point and uh, go towards greater trochanter or if you are using uh, x-rays towards antero inferior um, uh, iliac spine and then the length is almost 25 to 35 millimeters before you reach the SI joint and then after you cross the SI joint again around 35 to 65 millimeters so it is almost length is going to be around 70 to 100 millimeters so again this is what this is what i was talking you can um, palpate your greater trochanter and that is just above that is your antero inferior iliac spine so you can direct your screw towards that if you are doing a freehand technique so this it looks uh, you start with your drill or with your uh, gear shift and then go towards above uh, and towards and then this is the tear drop uh, which you can see and then it is going back, and then this is and then that's the screw so uh, this again we discussed and then we have to have if we have to do a um, uh, under the image guidance, you have to have this teardrop which is visible and then which gives you actually if you are more near towards the medial border of this teardrop that gives you more confidence that you are through and through in the uh, interosseous. Uh, and diameter you can use from 8 to 10 millimeters, length is 80 to 100 millimeters. So this is how it looks. This is till the uh, S1 and then this is 
uh, basically your S2 AI screws. They are in one line, so you don't need to have any connectors uh, for that. So this is a um, paper from who devised this technique and uh, they had very good results with that. And uh, basically, if you see that screw breakage and screw loosening of very well as to our ILEX screws. So, and uh, this is another study which said that basically the S2 AI screws are better than as compared to ILEX screws. Why it is better, which we have already discussed, because there's a minimal offset from the axis of the spine. They're less prominent, one rod, no connectors, and better control on the pelvis to correct the rotational and coronal deformity. Uh, this is again some studies which basically implants in S2 as ILEX screws. Therefore, pedicle screws and rods may have poor risk failure because there are less implant stresses when you do a S2 AI. So this is how you do basically percutaneous uh, S2 AI screws. Uh, you completely image guided or you can use navigation, you can use robotics also to uh, screws. Uh, now recently we have acquired this center uh, uh, utilize them for that. So there are surgery, if we do surgery, there can be complications. So there, there can be injuries in superior gluteal artery, neurological injuries at the sciatic nerve if you are not actually starting lateral to them and superior gluteal nerve can be injured. If two malpositions, there can be cortical, not actually uh, properly in the lateral position, then you can uh, pierce the basically sciatic notch or acetabulum causing basically acetabular impingement and sciatic nerve impingement with the screw. So there is again, as because the sacrum is a sacrum and ileum are the big bones, we can use uh, basically two screws. That is what is called as S1 AI screws and S2 AI screws into the uh, basically uh, pelvis to fuse the SI joint. And um, this again, the entry point is, uh, the S1 AI entry point is above the S1 and uh, in between the superior end plate and S1 foramen. And then, then the direction is almost the similar. So that is why you tend to converge along with S2 AI and S1 AI screws. So that's why the caudal angulation is 5 to 10 degrees more as compared to S2 AI screws. So that is how it looks. Both converge towards the uh, inferior iliac spine. So that's one of the just representative cases. If you see this, this is a neuromuscular scoliosis uh, who had uh, basically Arnold Chari malformation for this, uh, uh, the shunt was done. And if you see, there is a lot of pelvic obliquity and uh, hyperlordotic upper spine. And this is traction x-rays and this is CT scan. If you see this, he was not able to sit. He needed support from the hand uh, for, to sit. And he had basically meningomyelocele also, which was operated before. So this is what we did. These are two S2 AI screws and uh, corrected that uh, scoli. And if you see that the hyperlordotic spine is also, we pulled it up. And if you see the sitting balance is very nice. His hands are free now. So he's able to sit properly. So all said and done, it, it has advantages, but it also has disadvantages, uh, even especially in neuromuscular scoliosis. The ambulators, this is controversial right now, but some people say it's just a natural history, what they lose ambulation. But then when you go into the pelvis, if they use their lumbosacral junction to thrust themselves, they usually become non-ambulators. So ambulation and seat transfer capacity can because they use trunk muscles to do this. Increased chance of infection because there is a big exposure and increased chance of screw loosening because there is a lot of stress on this uh, screw. So this is another one of the examples where uh, we have done a iliac screw. So in conclusion, there are many techniques to do sacropelvic fixation. It has evolved over the years and uh, whatever you do, there is high rate of implant rate related problems. But then because S2 as screw has reduced it, tremendously lower complication rate compared to traditional fixations of iliac screws and effective in basically distant LS corrective procedures that is lumbosacral corrective procedure and there is no SI for two years.
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Guraj, that was a fantastic presentation. So uh, uh, really kept it very, very simple. And uh, as they say, the KISS principle. So uh, very clear presentation. Thank you. Uh, we know we got a question and answer session scheduled for the end of the meet. But if there's any questions uh, among the faculties, feel free to ask the questions uh, that you want to ask. No, you, you said it was kept very simple, but it, there were very complex cases. <laughs> Absolutely complex cases, but kept very, very simple. So that is a mark of great uh, surgeons, really, keeping complex things into a simple, breaking down into simple uh, uh, bits, basically. Yeah. Any questions, Matt? Do you have any uh, queries? No, no. Good. Uh, Dr. Guru, what, what exactly is the, uh, this uh, S2 AI screw that uh, you use? Uh, or, 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 or is this from the AO or uh, which, uh, who is producing these screws? No, the, these screws now, uh, they are, that is the beautiful thing about them. These, they are uh, basically like normal pedicle screws, but their diameter is big and they are longer in length. So that is why the, all the most, most of the companies all are producing these screws and Indian companies also do have these screws. Uh, but then coming to ILX screws, there were special designs from AO, there were special designs from Globus, there were special designs from Metronic. But then when it comes to S2AI screws, it doesn't need any special design. It just is a normal pedicle screws, which is bigger in diameter and longer in length. And uh, recently, a lot of uh, spinal surgeons have been saying that they're using 3D CT, uh, 3D X-ray quite a lot. I mean, do you have any experience of using this 3D X-ray theater? Uh, actually, uh, I have not used uh, 3D X-rays as such, but we do have navigation uh, and we do have robotics. So we are using that. Uh, so we don't have a 3D CM, but we do have uh, navigation and Mesorex robot. So we are using that. That's great. Uh, Dr. Neeraj Vijlanji, any questions on the OrthoTube uh, chat boxes? Uh, Dr. Neeraj, you are there? Yeah, probably he's muted, I think. So uh, uh, I think, yeah, so I think uh, we'll sort of move on to the, the next topic. Uh, uh, Dr. Guru, if you can uh, unshare your slides, then uh, Mr. Meza can share his slides. I have already done it. I have already, I have done. already done it. Okay. So, yeah, we can see Dr. Acharya's slides. If we like the dysfunction, evidence-based approach. That's great. All to you, Ms. All yours. Great. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Shri. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, the organizers uh, from Ortho TV as well. Um, Shri's a good friend of mine. I've known him for many years, um, and we've worked together uh, for, for many years as well. So. Uh, thank you once again for uh, inviting me to talk about sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Uh, thanks to uh, Inamax uh, Medical for supporting this uh, um, exciting webinar. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll spend the next uh, 35, 40 minutes just talking a little bit about sacroiliac joint dysfunction, um, some of the evidence, some of my experience as a, as a, as a pelvic and acetabular surgeon, um, and then try and talk about management, uh, protocols, treatment algorithms, etc. So what we'll do um, uh, over the space of the talk is talk a little bit about the definition, which um, um, Shri has already touched on. We'll talk etiology again, which Shri has touched on to some degree, the epidemiology, the presentation uh, of these patients, um, the differential diagnosis, and it's really important to understand that there can be other causes of, of discomfort in the posterior pelvis or the, or the lower back. Talk about the diagnosis um, and maybe how to perform them, um, investigations, treatments, and, and some of the protocols I use. Uh, we'll look at some cases and then we'll look at some evidence and outcomes. The definition, really, sacroiliac joint dysfunction or sacroiliitis um, are common terms used to describe the pain in the sacroiliac joint region. They're usually caused by abnormal motion, um, whether it be increased motion or decreased motion, and malalignment of the joint, as Shri has already al alluded to. 
the etiology, it, you know, it could be idiopathic, so there may not be a, an underlying cause or a or cause that is found. It could be degenerative, as we've talked about, post-traumatic, and I see quite a lot of these. So people who have had pelvic and acetabular fractures who come back with, with ongoing pain or chronic pain and who have degeneration. And you can see the two x-rays um, um, just on the right-hand side of the screen. So the top x-ray shows of a, a post-op patient, uh, a young lady who was in a nasty car accident, um, had a, um, a nasty uh, pelvic fracture to the right side of her pelvis, hemodynamically unstable, ended up losing a, a right leg as part of the trauma. And so she was mobilizing with the help of uh, an orthosis for many, many years. And this put an increased um, um, force through the back of the pelvis. Um, she ended up having lower back pain, sacroiliac joint pain, and ended up having a, a sacroiliac joint stabilization, which was fantastic. She went home on the same day of the operation. Um, she managed to mobilize in her uh, prosthesis fully weight bearing without any problem. So it does change lives. Other etiology where it, where it could be post uh, inflammatory. Uh, we've talked about uh, um, uh, the case of ankylosing spondylitis. It could be post infective, postpartum. Um, and as has as, as been mentioned, you know, the pelvis opens up um, during uh, uh, labor and then it usually closes back down again, but sometimes it doesn't quite close back um, as quickly or as, or as normally, and this can cause problems as well. And then you have other causes, tumors, et cetera. So we've seen some of these stats already uh, when Sri presented them, but a, a large proportion of the population will experience or present to the clinic with back pain or pathology. Um, it's the commonest presentation um, in the States uh, to the physician. And, and a study in 2005 looked at the cost implications of this, and it cost them 85 billion US dollars in that year. If we look at this uh, paper by Sembrano in 2009, this showed that 15 to 30% of patients with lower back pain may actually have pain related to the sacroiliac joint. How do these patients present? Well, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between high joint um, dysfunction syndrome and other types of lower back pain. There's a huge overlap in symptomatology. So this just lists some of the symptoms that the patients may present with. And it's important to realize that they may have one, two or more of these symptoms. So there's a, a huge overlap um, in the symptomatology, and it's sometimes very difficult to try and, and tease out exactly what's going on. So present with lower back pain, sometimes with thigh pain, difficulty sitting down for long periods of time, focal tenderness um, over the PSIS and in that region, um, some pain when the mechanically stressed, pain over the buttock on the affected side, sometimes shoot, uh, shooting pain, stabbing pain, um, sometimes uh, presents with radicular pain also, um, and, and you know certain movements, so um, pain while sitting down, lying on that side, getting up from that starting position. So what are the differential diagnoses? Well, you've got to think about other causes of radicular pain, um, so the lower back, uh, think about the facet joints, think about um, uh, spondyloarthropathies, think about tropenteric pain and radiation uh, from tropenteric pain syndrome. And then this is what we see quite commonly now in the state. In the UK, is patients who are living longer, um, patients who have osteoporosis and present with insufficiency type fractures. So no real trauma, atraumatic fractures uh, of the posterior pelvis, and they might present um, this type of what are the tests um, that you do and what are the tests I do in my clinic when I see patients with um, sacroiliac um, joint pain or posterior pelvic pain? So these, these are the tests that are, that are described and I tend to do um, out of the go through these because you'll be familiar with, some of them you may not be familiar with. And so the first test will start with the top right um, 
Uh, and this is essentially the distraction test. So patient lying supine, both hands on the anterior superior iliac spines or crests, and then just applying pressure, um, trying to distract that uh, the pelvis reproduces or provocates the, uh, uh, the, the symptoms, this is a positive test. Second test on the top line, this is the thigh thrust test. So essentially we're assessing the right side in this patient. One hand goes underneath the, the uh, sacroiliac joint, the sacrum, and then you apply pressure in a downward fashion. So you thrust the thigh down towards the SI joint and see if that provocates the pain. Um, the image on the right-hand side, the top line, this is the uh, compression test. So patient lying on the unaffected side, you push down on the affected side again, trying to provocate those symptoms. And then you move to the prone position. So you have the patient in the prone position and you apply your hand, the flat of your hand, over the back of the uh, sacroiliac joint. Again, apply pressure. Uh, in the downward fashion, and again, see whether this provocates the, the, the pain. Then you have um, Ganslin's test, where uh, in this particular um, image, you're assessing the right side. So the right side, the, the hip is flexed up, the knee is flexed up, the patient's holding it. The uh, opposite side, the left, uh, the, the hip is extended, and what you're doing is applying pressure in a downward fashion on the right side and opposing that pressure by trying to extend the, the hip out uh, on the opposite side. And if this reproduces pain, um, this, is, this uh, is thought to be due to SI joint as well. And then um, the one that wasn't described in Laslett's paper in 2005 is the one in color, uh, and that's the Faber test, the Faber 4 test, the four action, abduction and external rotation and then applying downward pressure on the knee to see whether this reproduces some pain in the SI joint. So the tests I tend to use in my outpatient clinic, uh, all of them ex except for the Ganslons test. Um, so I use five out of the six. And this paper by Laslett was, was really interesting. So what they did is they looked at the sensitivities and specificities of all of these tests apart from the Faber test. And they, and they showed that if you have more than three which are positive, this gives you a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 78% for SI joint as the uh, um, uh, pain initiator. So what else can you do? So you've done your clinical assessment and then we're gonna get some um, investigation. So plain x-rays, but as we've already heard times, you know, it's very difficult to see what's going on with the SI joints on, on standard plain imaging. A CT scan can be helpful. Um, it, can, it can hopefully try and rule out some of the other causes that we talked about for, for posterior pelvic and buttock pain. Um, but again, usually SI joint dysfunction, unless there's marked degeneration, you may not see anything obvious. You may know, subtle subtle signs, or we'll talk about some of the subtle signs and going on with the SI joint. And then on, the MRI scan again, again, the MRI scan can be a CT very scan helpful, can be helpful. Um, Cheers, etc. Et et um, you may try and increase the edema in some of the other areas that we talked about. Again, the MRI scan may not show much abnormality, but again, usually SI joint dysfunction. You've done your clinical degeneration. You may not. You've yeah, done some of your basic investigation, the investigation, and then and the and 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 so what do you do? What do you do? So they've had the way I do positive they've had their imaging and then they've had um um a positive response to the injection. What I tend to do with the injections is the diagnosis of the specific rate and over a period of time. And when I mean positive, it's because of them 
to have about 70 to 80 percent of each of the leaves to be moved before a period of time that's been collected and had their imaging and then would give me some reassurance that they would try the actual imaging or was the cause of this pain, the injection, what are the treatment options for this then, so each panel of these things, you think about the use of therapies, trying to strengthen the core, and the back, and the back muscles, and think about sacral cells, then binders, etc. You can repeat the injections if they've had a great therapy treatment for months, and sometimes you see longer, just to repeat the injections, and that might give them enough symptomatic relief. What are the treatment options for this then? If their symptoms occur or they don't have a prolonged response to the injection, then you may well think about offering a surgery to stabilize the sacral joint. The injections have been had So this is essentially my um, algorithm and pathway for the physician that I see, and it's quite to give them crude early treatment. But I think it's very, very helpful. So I have a patient who they don't have a pelvic pain. Or I see them, I see them, I see them, I see them, I I see them, 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 I them, I see 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 what I tend to do is if, if they have a good symptomatic prolonged relief, they may just end up having another injection in a year's time or two years' time. Um, they may require symptom imaging, and they will have physiotherapy to strengthen up their core and their back muscles. But if they have a response that they recur, or don't last for a prolonged period of time, and these are the ones that men consider uh, stabilizing if they have a good symptomatic prolonged through a few cases, um, just to try and highlight a, a few points, time surgical techniques, um, um, a few of the, the imaging modalities and some of the subtle signs as well that you may all want to pick up. So it's one, um, it's important to realize these cases, actually, I um, take a lot of these safe violet referrals for, for, for our region, so I get a lot of referrals from spinal surgeons, from, from other head surgeons from other pelvic surgeons, etc., that get sent in to, uh, to our unit. So the really specialized unit, so we see quite a large number of these patients. For all females, um, by my spinal surgery colleague um, in one of the patients, um, she's got some left posterior pain, pain, joint pain, but she's also got some spinal um, anterior thigh pain. And the other thing to understand in these patients is that so really, if they really just you know, have a lot of money, they'll have something else going on. And it's important that you try and even try and work out what that other thing is. So this was the plain films of her spine. You see an AP spinal tray of the thorax and the lumbar sacral spine. You see a lateral view as well. And you can see that she does have some degeneration in that lower level. Something else going on. So she has, has clinical assessment. She can work three out of the other thing is uh, uh, five tests, which are uh, positive, yeah. tests, which are positive. Yeah. She goes on to have a CT guided injection and some of the And as you mentioned, it's really important to try and isolate that inferior portion of the SI joint. That's the joint assessment. Part of the joint, the upper part of the joint is quite a fibrous joint, and it's difficult to get the needle in. It's a true indication uh, of the result. So, essentially, get it in that inferior portion. Um, pre injection, the pain was 
So this is her post-op, two years post-op, pain is better by 75 to 80%. Um, and, that, and that's a good result for her. She's really happy with that. Case two, um, this is a 53-year-old female. Uh, she had a previous three-level um, ACDF, so uh, uh, cervical spine fusion. She's got extensive degeneration of the uh, lumbar spine. Um, she's got Bertolotti joints bilaterally. And she's got pain in bilateral sacroiliac joints in the posterior pelvis. So again, she's been seen by another one of my spinal colleagues. And this is what she looked like um, when you look at her x uh, in the uh, uh, AP uh, and the lateral positions. You can see that she's quite big. She's got quite marked lordosis, a bit of scoliosis as well, a bit of a curve. Um, she's got quite marked degeneration. Um, she had the previous cervical surgery, as I've said. So I'll just run through this scan. And this just shows some of the degeneration in her lower lumbar spine. The reason why I put this up is so that when we get to the SI joints, just run through that, just run through that. I'll get to the SI joints here. So I'm going to let that run for a second. So a bit of sclerosis, nothing too major at the SI joints there. Just going down a little bit further and oops, I just go back, just tried to stop it there. My apologies, let me just run that once more. And I'll stop it where I think the important bit to see is. So if you look there on the uh, left, iliac joint, what you can see is that there looks to be a bit of gas in the SI joint. And as we go further down, we see a similar sort of appearance on the right side as well. There, there, there. And again, this is just a subtle sign that the, the more movement than within those joints. And those joints may be under more stress than normal. It just gives you another idea of of, of those joints as the, as the cause of pathology. Again, this patient has clinical assessment, has the imaging, and then has diagnostic injections. Um, and this is what I mean. It, it's important. This injection um, isn't great. The one on the left-hand side, I think it's too high up. And the injection on the right is a little bit better. It'll be lower down. But this is the area where you'd ideally want to do the injection, very low down in the SI joint. This patient has um, an, um, uh, an improvement in pain from 9 to 10 to completely gone for a period of two weeks. So, and similarly, this patient has um, sacroiliac joint stabilizations on both sides. Uh, this is done in the prone position this time um, because there's nothing else to do here, really. Um, and I do uh, both sides. I do one side, my registrar or my fellow does the other side. And you can see I've put... Um, uh, uh, two large 12.5 um, millimeter silex fenestrated screws, um, and then a smaller 11 millimeter non-fenestrated uh, screw on one side, and I've managed to get two screws on the other side. 
So these are the x-rays. I think this was about 18 months down the line. Again, the patient is extremely happy. Pain um, that they had really joint um, has almost completely gone. Uh, again, about an 80% improvement. Case three, um, this is a slightly older male. So this is a 73-year-old male. Um, uh, had a previous L2 to ileum fusion. Um, it, it was a, a limited lumbar did down to the ileum um, with some of those screws that uh, Dr. Gururaj explained, but not the um, uh, S, S2AI screws. Um, patient had previous DVTs and PEs, was on warfarin, and had pain over the, over the right SI joint. Again, clinical tests were positive, more than three of them were positive for SI joint pain. So the patient had a, 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 a targeted injection. These are the pre-op x-rays. Um, you see the, the fusion uh, down to uh, the ileum. Again, just the CT scan. Showing um, the fusion. It remains good, but again, showing that subtle sign of some gas in the sacroiliac joint. Again, possibly indicating excessive movement uh, and possibly uh, the cause of. So this is the typical position where I think the diagnostic injections uh, should be placed low down into the uh, SI joint, as you can see here, followed uh, with um, some contrast, which is, which is injected to ensure that you're in the right place. And this patient had uh, um, uh, a good response to the injection. So again, in this case, I. Uh, Stabilized, fuse the uh, the right uh, sacroiliac joint. Managed to get uh, two screws into uh, one, um, but I, I couldn't get a third screw due to the uh, the iliac screws. So smaller screws in. Again, there you go. Post op, um, uh, very happy uh, with the clinical functional result. So last case, case number. Four. So this is a, a 77 year old, um, interesting, and, uh, Dr. Shri, Shri Khan, my friend, uh, talked about um, the relationship between the spine and the pelvis, functional stability and the functional movement. Um, this was an interesting case, uh, a 77 year old man who had quite severe arthritis in his hip. Um, he had a hip replacement for his arthritis. Uh, he was known to have losing spondylitis, his, his, sp his spine and his uh, 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 SI joint uh, were open prior to uh, his hip replacement. However, after replacement, he still had some pain in the groin, which was different and he had some pain in his right posterior. I think he was referred to me by my colleagues in a hospital about 40 miles away uh, referred to me about uh, three years of hip replacement. Uh, problems with the hair, um, the wound was fine, but it's in general or anything like that. So again, uh, assess the patient, do all the tests, the provocation tests, and the provocation tests for a joint uh, um, uh, dysfunction uh, were positive. And so I was going to send him off some injections, but I couldn't. Uh, so I assessed that in a little bit more detail and actually found his um, uh, was a and it was possibly uh, changing. So that's what he had. He had a clinical assessment, no irritation on that, and he had a uh, positive test for SI joint provocation. The CT again just shows the lowest, but also showing his SI points. 
He's got uh, ankylosing cysts. And I was keen to look at the hip replacement as well. Just but there wasn't anything going on with his hip replacement to explain the pain he had. But his psoas was clinically irritating him, so the plan with him uh, was this. So I did it in a stage fashion. Um, we uh, uh, arthroscoped his hip, uh, one city, and that improved his groin pain. And then he came back. And I did his uh, sacral iliac joint um, on the things really well. How do I manage these patients? So I've um, stabilized their sacral iliac joint, I have their surgery, um, and I usually try and do them at the uh, beginning of the operation list, try and do them first on the list. I let them wait there with the help of crutches as toy. I get the physios to see them uh, before. Um, and um, a core uh, strengthening program. You can get them the same day if I can. Um, if, if they're in pain or if they're lateral, sometimes they overnight, go home the next day. Get a scan of them. So, my first 10 uh, to about. Um, but now I'm tending to allow uh, my pelvic and fractures. I want to know where the implants are uh, on day one. And so I will get a, a CT scan, a limited CT, just posterior pelvis to discharge. And then see them in like, um, at six weeks, three months, and at the one year x rays. And they have x rays and outcome forms. So a little bit of evidence now comes in. So, when I started up about 10 years ago, I was, I was seeing coming back, former, etc. And I was using maybe one SI joint a year, something like that, this trauma. Uh, and I was doing the open, actually. So I was um, using a lateral window under iliacus, uh, opening up the uh, joint right a little bit sometimes, or a curette. And then uh, using some again for the crest necessary, and then putting um, a four hole uh, small fragment plates um, at about 70 degrees to each other PSI to allow those to fuse up. However, you know, times have changed and people have more things through limited incisions and through uh, extraneous uh, approach. And the, the advantage certainly in, in numerous papers show that the short operating time with the minimum is uh, reduced blood loss and also reduced hospital stay. If we look at um, current evidence, the paper came out almost a year ago last year, and this is a review um, of all the literature out there, they call iliac joint stabilization. Um, and two graphs from that paper are talk here. The one on the left looks at the analog, the one on the right, at the Oswald Street uh, ability index. So if we concentrate on analogs, 80 is there, which they call iliac um, uh, dysfunction and treatment of these. And some of them, um, there's uh, a uh, rational trial, um, there's a couple of uh, uh, level, is in there, most of them are level, level four uh, studies, 18 studies, and pool all the data for all these studies. What it shows that improvement in pain visual analog for these patients who undergo Stabilization. The pre op visual analyze uh, visual score and to about 30 after surgery. Oswald Street Index um, uh, studies here about 10. And again, if we look at the Oswald Street Disability Index, there's a improvement between that pre op stop. 
And so just seeing that in uh, a slightly format in bar charts, those were forest plots on the on the previous slide. The study um, for the so the panel, um, quite a monument post uh, uh, sacroiliac joint surgery, and then a look to their uh, disability index, the uh, osteodisability disability indexing. That is, there is improvement. So in summary, we've talked a little bit about um, the G of Crowley. We've talked about um, the epidemiology, some of the history, uh, of open techniques, etc. Incorporation of the patient, it's important to understand that you know, there is a diagnosis, there may be something else um, uh, going on as well. Think about the diagnostic test. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, provocative tests and how you're going to interpret them, and how they're going to you decide what investigations uh, these have, whether they should have the diagnostic injection, whether it should be you doing them, or whether it should be one of the radiologists. And then just think about um, treatment protocols. So, you know, I've, I've shared my treatment protocol, protocol and how I think about things but you may well have on that works for you. And then just think it's an outcome. So a lot of out there, um, most of it is level four studies. There are some randomized control trials as well. The pool there, which is really strong, um, is the visual analogs, the decision there to improve these patients' surgery. Thank you much. Uh, the questions I asked, uh, says that he doesn't have any in his chat to be because apparently there to ban the climate. Uh, any questions from actually Dr. Yeah. Dr. Achha, do you EMP to no, so I use the graph of K use synthetic. No B no. Uh, and uh, uh, how do you prepare the surface for the future just goes in? There will be a uh, basic there. I, how do you prepare this? Sir? Yeah, that's, that's when I used to do open, I, I could joint do them simultaneously. It's a little more tricky. Uh, uh, silent, it is a little in once you. That hole, put the instrument in the, under image and turn that room through six degrees and decorate that joint. Quite what you're getting is you're not complete, you're getting fusion in a particular um, area. Perhaps you. So, instrument is uh, axial, so we have this hook which is going to. From to L5, I had a fan that go there and it used to go 180 and turn and the surface. Right. We people of, you know, um, I do uh, often surgery, people about even speak SI. Yes, it was only as uh, going through a brochure, put a two. Look into the and see what exactly uh, do you uh, make it. I think you a private practice at my, but you know, I've been in being the essence. But topic is, yeah. But the one I see, like, say, is not 
platform the it has its own uh, up inside it its own pocket so when if i as for it is a surface i joined it's and joint it is a different and then about 30% of individual have mark prism um and so they will shape panel they'll have um uh looping processes so you hear the difficult more fixation you know getting image so getting mri and all who won't much joint it will anatomy in that planet but have you a nation or um this yeah uh, that's another talk actually i i have um, we have the uh, in our hospital um but i think the oh is stick when it comes in is where i've had a pre trauma already some deformity when it's very small way the computer see will be whether you know is a question one more yeah yeah so you use dental fix fuse surgery uh, yeah so the <laughs> a few things uh, so the ten sticks in uh, a met um um vice so singular uh, toe type uh, ten sticks yes and uh a slight different um, uh, but what they are is the um, a a large plug which you then I have you and you thoughts with my concern in elderly who have been a osteoporosis um there have been a fracture etc um only you know the the um very encouraging and uh, in terms of for of exclusion uh, do you all three two screw how do you decide and uh, yeah um i think you need screws idea the idea being three if you can and if metal work you might get the in but again that's a thing process what really important is why a your fragment if that is then you can usually get because it's not possible if you've got like sacrum uh, but you need to at least to um 
three depends on it depends if there's any metal work uh, make sure that the uh, so that is to do a topic uh, uh, in last we when not this to inject one person of the used to get uh really is uh, uh radial and procedure have any study which is a procedure how many times i and think in the joint yeah that's a good question man what i tend to reduce um uh, i don't know the the result is off hand due to try is that problem i send them to one list just who's and and my colleague so oh, he does so oh, he does all the joints um, and he will uh, um uh, die into the joint he'll put the needle in he'll put the needle confirm uh, so find minimal variation as possible and so and so what i will do it since may have had my joint in jeopardy somewhere in, in three but uh, whether the positive result negative result will still get two more with my wrist i think doctor there are no question box uh uh Yeah. Yes. Please wait. It's coming. Jerry, what is it? You know, have the the interesting things going on. Is, you know, your and it's I sort of wanted to ask you your experience with someone to you with technology and procedure to it and going. and through to we now with how the act the one something new coming and how adapted your port of what you do that that's a really good question you know my my um uh, sort of ground as it is and arthroscopy and as tabular trauma so I'm imaging the I'm used to patients and what I, so we follow up all of the pelvic and acetabular matches for five years and what I'm seeing in the clinic is that there were a few patients who did to come back with ongoing pain in their post actually where it did was from the traumatic sacral joint pain and iliac joint dysfunction and so as looking at these patients i started managing these patients Actually, some of these patients had a good result. Those block and the injections. Hence, I thought, okay, um, maybe you know that is the driver of the pain. There was a lot of skept uh, skeptics in the tabular uh, world, and so I looked at the, um, assessed them, then ended up doing my joint stabilization on them, and they had. good outcomes the pain was much better the mobility better word out and i start getting referrals from my colleagues um from my hip colleagues um from everyone and i thought well actually you know open procedure have more associated with increased length etc so i was keen on trying to use a minimum techniques to achieve this and that so uh, uh people like yourself um contacted me and we got in touch etc and, and you know the patient benefited from this uh, i think the gentleman the therapist uh, he brought a, a message to, uh he's asking is your therapy in sacral dysfunction so guru couldn't tell much so if uh, guru could start uh, Uh, you know, I say, then can add in a word or so. So, uh, I, as I mentioned, one once that we all know and we agree that uh, therapy and techniques are main of treatment. As functions, a few of them do need as I said, 
in the air. So definitely in physiotherapy, all other modes for other than actually the managing therapy has proven very good, especially the gliding of the joints, what in manipulation. Uh, if you know Mulligan stick, uh, so they do it does help. And I think the main mode of treatment for uh, SI joint disease is physiotherapy and Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, most of the patients uh, can have improvements with conservative and operative measures. Uh, and I think strengthening uh, the back muscles, um, the refining the multifidus, et cetera, uh, having a good core support. So I agree. I think the therapy has, a, has a, a, an excellent prime role. And that's why, so in my, in my algorithm, um, they all see the physio um, uh, as an outcome. And then any of them to surgery, again, uh, physio after that. Jason, anything else you want to add? That, that, that was almost, um, almost done. Two sort of names that you in your SID. What is the the sort of mix between structural and the in information patients? Where 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 do you see those sort of numbers? Yeah, you mean like the, the post instrumentation uh, between stru the structural patient and a, a inflammation patient? What, what in in your practice do you see? Sort of percentage. Yeah, so I think mine at seventy. So more pre prevalent on structural and yeah. in, than in the the in. But I think part part of that is we have sort of um, with some of the gists, the rheumatologists take all the inflammatory side, and so. Uh, the the other important to note is we've talked about management and we've talked about insurance physio, but with inflammatory type of arthritis and arthritis, there are some pretty good medications out there that have management. So um, I may be seeing them, may not. Okay. Uh, Guru, you got any questions or just to Dr. Guru? Jason, you have any questions, Dr. Gura? Not at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, one thing, um, Gura. So the you know we talk about navigation, but the other thing we've done is we're, we've been joint cases, so presentation, to I uh, uh, and coming in my joint. So essentially, it's in, in the trauma thing. It's uh, essentially triangular fusion. Um, and that essentially what we're doing is providing that plane of fixation. Um, and that is choices as well. So we work very well together with the panel guys. Yeah, to work together. Definitely, the, right, when in a situation, it's always uh, full to have a spell along the surgeon and you mix match things, get up a strong base to have a Spine about. Any Shrik as well? Any question? 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 Any um, I think, you know, a lot of uh, questions, we are coming to the program and the end of our time schedule. So we really take this opportunity to, again, uh, our faculty, Dr. Gururaj and Dr. Mehlacharya, and to our sponsor, Jason John, and a big thank you to Dr. Neera Nani, our broadcast across India, to uh, our friend, you know, David, uh, for Trump, miracle. So, uh,
much uh, to everyone. And uh, I think what we is uh, uh, going to do some live study about uh, this particular vision is Alex Group, probably by around end of April time. So once that is ready, so we have a second a webinar and we can uh, broadcast live uh, from uh, Bristol to see how it was uh, done. And maybe if you got any cases coming up, very ones, you can sort of club there and uh, you can broadcast Delhi. He can broadcast from Bristol. It would be amazing. Fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Jason, so I think the, the information for the um, Silex, etc., will be available on this website. On the the internet's website. Yes. Yeah. Let's be with all Everybody has got it. Go through that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good evening to UK and good morning to the US. And good night to India. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone.